Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. It wouldn't be the holiday season if there wasn't candy, right? Celebrate the holiday season with the Holiday Crush. They've sprinkled candy with a holiday theme and fun-packed challenges every week for five whole weeks, finishing on January 4th. The more challenges you complete, the better your chances of unwrapping delicious rewards. So, are you ready to crush the holidays? Play the Holiday Crush now. Download it from the App Store, Google Play, or Windows Store for free. Terms and conditions apply. Ich warte seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's ein Rhythmus, als gäb's ein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen. Hello and welcome to Gegen Pressing. The German football podcast from the Football Grad Network. I'm your host, Bryce Dunn. And joining me, as always, is Chris Williams. Chris, how have you been? Uh, very good, Bryce, thanks. I would like to be enjoying a nice Bundesliga break, but obviously you've still got um, Premier League fixtures to look after. So, yeah, it's been, been nice and busy. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Christmas period was good. New Year's was good. It was a bit more relaxed, a bit more relaxed than the likes of you working away. Um, but, um, yeah, missing, missing the Bundesliga now as well. It feels like it's been a while, doesn't it? Um, oh, joining Chris and I, as always, is uh, Manu Vett. Manu, how are you? Are you enjoying the, the winter break in Germany? Yeah, I am enjoying the winter break. It's been, it's been nice. Um, unlike you guys, the only two leagues that I cover, MLS and Bundesliga are completely off right now, so all I'm doing is writing feature articles on various transfers, um, diving a little bit into the history of the game. It's It's been a nice uh, change of pace. It's the last week, too, that we have this, because, of course, next week we, we get get going again. Well, that's it. We're closing in again. We're almost a week away from the Bundesliga returning, but we're back to talk um, well, a bit of a special podcast to talk about uh, transfers and other goings on in the league in this off period. And joining the three of us, we've got a very special guest. We're very excited about this one, uh, all the way from Fox Soccer um, Channel. We've got Keith Costigan. Keith, um, Thank you very much for uh, spending the time with us this evening, um, um, coming on the podcast. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know who you are, shame on you, um, but could you possibly explain how you managed to get to the position that you're in at the moment? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, you know, I've worked at Fox Sports for about 14, 15 years, covered every competition, the Premier League, the Champions League, the Europa League, and... You know, luckily enough, two, three seasons ago, we, we got the rights to the Bundesliga. And it, it's a league I followed anyway. So since then, I've been covering every weekend, fell in love with it. And uh, I just think the added fact that we have young American players breaking through in the Bundesliga makes it, you know, almost a must watch every weekend over here in the States. Absolutely. We will be talking about that link between uh, the US and, and the Bundesliga all in good time. But uh, Keith, you said that you were into the Bundesliga anyway before uh, Fox even got the, uh, the rights for it. Um, was there a particular team that you uh, supported or what was it got you into the Bundesliga or was it just that you were analyzing football around Europe and around the world and you just wanted to stay attuned? Yeah, I, I think I've always been a student of the game. I'm someone that I commentate, but I have a, a UEFA A license as well. So I've I've come across many people that have worked in the game in, in Germany. But yeah, I, I think if I'm being completely honest, the, the the time that it really captured my imagination was when Jurgen Klopp, you know, brought Borussia Dortmund to everybody's attention. The style that they played, the the results against the likes of Real Madrid in in Champions League. Yes, everybody always knew about Bayern Munich. And even Borussia Dortmund sides in the past, but there was something special about that team, something special about the way Klopp presented himself. And I, I think that really captured my imagination. And, you know, the Bundesliga has had my uh, attention since then. Yeah, absolutely. What a side that was. And Chris and I are lucky enough to enjoy him now being at Liverpool uh, as well. So, um, I, I mean, Keith, um, I suppose just one further question was apart from that Klopp, um, you know, Dortmund side, what what is it that you 
you really find fascinating, interesting, and possibly exciting about the Bundesliga? Is there anything that possibly stands out there? Yeah, I, I think the fact that you know it's it's a league that allows young players to to play and develop. Um, I, you know, for me, it's it's fascinating to watch. You know, eighteen, nineteen year old players. You know, going back to Dortmund right now and seeing Pulisic and Sancho. I, I think that's a theme across the league. If there's young, talented players in the squad, they're going to be given that opportunity. So, so that's always fascinated me, and I'm always fascinated by the fact that you know any league that has that one giant, uh, Bayern Munich. How do you topple them? How do you how do you fight against the biggest juggernaut in the league and and a team that invariably will sign your best player if you do beat them? So, um, every year I, I come in with the hope that someone will challenge them. Uh, I, I've been let down over the last couple of seasons, but. Midway through this campaign, you know, it seems like we're going to have a title race. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like a rather exciting season, doesn't it? And a good thing for the league. Um, guys, um, let's uh, jump in then and start talking about the transfer news that's um, come our way. R- rather exciting one. We'll go to Chris on this one. Um, Christian Bulisic, um, obviously been at Dortmund for four seasons. Um, he's played over 80 games for them. Uh, but he's going to Chelsea at the end of the season. Now, th- this is a move that we had talked about was on the cards for a little while, but he's he, he has been loaned back at the end of the season. Uh, such a massive deal. Uh, but what exactly does this mean for Dortmund? Is is it something that you know they're going to be concerned about, or has he kind of had his time? Well, I think it'd be unfair to say he's had his time, but on current form and form for the past eighteen months, this is a unbelievable piece of business for Dortmund 60 but 64 65 million euros um for a player that is in essence third choice at the moment and the main thing for Dortmund is they keep him until the end of the season so if something does happen to Sancho or does happen to Brun Larsen or Royce they've got you know a ready-made very very good player to come in um I'll be really intrigued to see Pulisic play for the rest of the season because he's not looked right and he's looked every inch a player who needs a move and he's got that move now so he may be I spoke the other uh, spoke last week about this to to another podcast and said I'm expecting him to play like the shackles are off him now mentally and maybe we'll see the Pulisic we saw under Tuchel and that would be phenomenal if they could help Dortmund to a title fight and Dortmund get you know a lot of money for for what is a player who is maybe plateaued slightly on his development. But I think it's a win-win for everybody. I think it's a win for Chelsea because he's a marketing machine as well and he's a very talented youngster. I just hope he, I really hope he gets the development time that he's going to need at Chelsea. It's not really known as a club for, you know, um, developing talent or maybe giving talent the time. You see how quickly Abramovich chops and changes a manager when it's not going particularly well. I just hope that with Sarri coming in, he'll get the sort of development he needs. But I think... It's one of these very strange transfers that's a win for everybody involved. It's a win for Pulisic, it's a win for Borussia Dortmund, and eventually it'll be a win for Chelsea. Yeah, very exciting times, very interesting times, uh, I think, for everyone involved. Um, Manu, um, what, um, what do you think? Do you think that this is um, this is the right time for Christian Pulisic to go on? And do you think that, as Chris said, he, he's going to probably play with a, a bit more freedom now you know even if that's just a, in a mental capacity and I suppose then the final thing is wouldn't it be nice for him to go out and uh, leave Dortmund with you know, that title medal well, this is what he said right that he wants to leave Dortmund with with the championship um, I, I'm very much with Chris on this one I think I mean I've I've been one of those critics I wrote an article on Pro Soccer USA about two months ago where um, I pointed towards this transfer happening and how Pulisic has really struggled this season. And when you, when you look at his numbers, um, it, it almost felt like that Dortmund developed mm, rapidly this year and he didn't really, for whatever reason, wasn't able to match that development. Um, he had other players pass him, Brun Larsen, Sancho, um, and in many ways in the last few games, Rafael Guerrero as well. And, um, you know, this is, that's, that's maybe a sign, but there's, there's, there was reasons for it, good reasons for it too. He was the marketing machine, um, in the two US trips that Dortmund had this year, right? They went to Los Angeles to open the new stadium for LAFC and then the International Champions Cup where they put him front center, um, everything that they were doing just to, just to more or less, um, use that marketing potential that he has. So, 
maybe that's something that hurt him um, in this first half of the season and hurt his development because he was playing so much in the US, right? And then ever since then, he's been struggling with injuries. When I was in Dortmund, he was hurt. Um, I was trying to, hoping for a quick interview with him for an article I was doing for Pro Soccer USA and he, he, he wasn't available for it because he was struggling with injuries. So maybe this is something that will just, uh, you know, be a weight off his shoulders and help his potential to develop his potential because it's, that's certainly there. So if we go to Keith on this one, I mean, Keith, firstly, what has your opinion been on uh, Pulisic this season? And then I suppose w- with you being based in the US, uh, how have you know, maybe fans of his um, seen his season going? You know, what Do they think that he's being hard done by maybe at Dortmund? Because some people are saying that you know, he, he's maybe stalled a little bit in his uh, growth. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair a fair assessment. Uh, I think most people would would feel that this was going to be the season where he would have to kick on and you know show that promise that we've seen in patches over the last couple of years. Um, and and he simply hasn't. Now, if Borussia Dortmund hadn't been playing well, you could probably have a little bit of sympathy for Pulisic. But the team has done so well. Uh, Jaden Sancho, who's younger than him, uh, less experienced than him, has come in and and shown that end product in the final third on. So many different occasions this season, even in big games like against Bayern Munich. So I, I think we've gone away from just uh, evaluating Pulisic and said, hey, we, we're, we're going to compare him now to Jaden Sancho and his development because they're both considered up and coming, you know, top class world stars. Um, and and I, I think everybody's kind of a little bit worried about that next step for, for Christian. I know you guys had mentioned, you know, maybe the shackles are off. Um, I'm worried in that regard too because I don't think there's that much pressure on him to perform in the Bundesliga as there will be at a club like Chelsea. Um, so if you go over there and you think you're going to have less pressure, um, I, I think it's going to be a different story for him. So um, I think it's it, it's a great move for Borussia Dortmund. They they almost got the Naby Keita deal for uh, for Pulisic, you know, despite the fact that he's not on a long term deal with Dortmund. So I think Dortmund, you're incredibly happy and. I think for Chelsea, you know, you've signed a player with great marketing potential, but I think he's got to elevate his game to be considered that on-field threat that we, we thought he would be just, you know, 12, 18 months ago. And I suppose, Keith, what exactly is the reception in the US? Uh, are they excited about this move You to the Premier League? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Look, the Premier League is a, is a massive, you know, vehicle in this country. It's uh, it, it, it gets tremendous press and just the, the, the simple fee alone. I, I think one of my colleagues just tweeted out an American was sold to Chelsea for over $70 million. And it, it, it wasn't a case of Pulisic. It was just like to, to have a, a young American player be considered that valuable to sign for one of the biggest clubs in England. Um, I, I think everybody's happy. Um, but I, I think people that are more nuanced in the game are, are skeptical and saying, well, look, Chelsea – are one of those clubs, it doesn't matter if they spent that much money on you. If you're not producing, you won't be in the side. So there is that element of fear that, yes, you know, he wanted to make that next step. He wanted to play in the Premier League. But if he doesn't perform, Chelsea is going to be a very difficult place to, to, to make your way into that starting 11. And I might keep hearing about, well, the chance to work with Sarri. You, you look at the longevity of Chelsea managers. I don't think you can think like that at a club like Chelsea because – you know, two, three years seems to be the max Abramovich goes with anybody. So um, we'll see if, if he gets to work with Sarri and, and if he does, how long he does get to work with Sarri. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chris, I'm just going to put the question to you. Um, obviously, you, you work quite closely with the with the Premier League uh, with all your work with Liverpool. And uh, do you see the, um, Pulisic getting into this Chelsea side? Well, then that's dependent on, on what they want to see. Will he... Um, get ahead of Willian or Pedro or um, Hazard. You know, Hazard goes. If Hazard goes, I think he's going to be in. Um, he's going to have even more added pressure. Uh, will he get in? I'm not 100 percent sure he'd, he'd start at the moment. If he came now, so if he was to move in January, would he start straight away? I, I would be doubtful whether he would. But maybe that's going to play into his favour, having six months to get back playing again and and to get into some sort of form and. You know, undoubtedly, when he moves, he'll be completely revitalised and reinvigorated. And when he starts pre-season training with Chelsea, you know, I expect him to do well. But 
is he going to be named in the first Premier League game of the season? And will he be continue to be in that for the next six or seven games after that? I think that's what we'll have to wait and see. And how will he react if he's not? How will he, the fans react to him if he has a couple of bad games because he's not settling? You know, I think everybody's seen the, the problems Naby Keita's had um, from moving from the Bundesliga to the Premier League. And he's an exceptional talent as well. The case being dogged by a few injuries, a few niggles, maybe not playing in the same position he was used to with Leipzig. But he still needs a bit of a transition time. And, and like he said, that that's maybe my worry for him. Does he get that transition time? Because, you know, Fernando Torres went for a lot of money um, a long time ago to Chelsea and he really didn't get any transition time. And he was, he was you know, he found himself being a bit part player and then eventually moving on. Yeah, Liverpool fans do like to bring that one up, don't we? Um, uh, Manu, if if we look at it from a Dortmund perspective, obviously they've got Pulisic back on them. We've mentioned that. But uh, long term, are they going to look to bring in a replacement for him? Well, whether that's in January and you know the, the player that they bring in may get to feature a little bit more um, as of next season or or even in the summer. I mean, is there anyone being, being mentioned? Yeah, um, I mean, the... The one player that comes up or the name that comes up is, of course, Torgan Hazard. Um, we've mentioned that on this podcast in the past. Um, Chris in particular mentioned him. So that's a name that's been, um, you know, Gladbach won in the region of 40 million euros. I, I reckon that price will go down slightly. But that's a player who's 25, who had a fantastic year in the Bundesliga this year. And I think someone who can step in right away, knows the league already. And I think that is, that's a big one in the Bundesliga, right? To know the language, to know what kind of football is expected of you. Um, that you don't have the transitional phase. He could just come in and be a good player for Dortmund. So that is definitely someone who they have on their list. Um, another player who's recently come up and I know there's going to be a very big bidding war on him if he doesn't renew his contract with Leipzig. That's Timo Werner. And, um, I know at least uh, two other clubs that are very confident of having a good chance of landing him. So Dortmund ha- are now looking in that kind of category. I think that is really the kind of fascinating aspect of the Timo Werner story that Dortmund are looking at bringing in a player like Timo Werner. I guess that really shows you that they're seeing themselves making that next step from being just a development club to maybe being a club where players will see out their careers. I mean, they, you could sort of have a little bit of an inkling that that was happening when they signed Witzel. Hazard would be similar. Werner would definitely be a statement transfer. So those are just some names that um, that have been mentioned, and I think that they could rightfully, um, you know, compete for because even if they do not win the title, they would still be in the Champions League next year. And um, I think they missed the kind of money they have been making on the transfer market in the last two years alone. They now are in a very good financial position. So I think. Um, I think whatever they're going to bring in is going to be a really big hit in Dortmund. Hi, this is Rachel Fisher. And this is Desi Jenikin. And we host the Hollywood Crime Scene Podcast. We're really excited to tell you about the best Christmas ever on AMC+, Plus, where every day feels like Christmas morning. It's the holiday season, and that means it's time to see old friends like Buddy the Elf, Heat Miser, and Clark Griswold. Plus, you get a stocking stuffed with highly acclaimed AMC series like The Walking Dead and Mad Men, new series like Gangs of London and The Walking Dead World Beyond. They're all here on AMC+. Plus. So celebrate the best Christmas ever, anytime, anywhere. AMC Plus is the gift that keeps on giving all year long. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus, only the good stuff. One gift that never gets returned? Trick question. It's three gifts, beer, wine, and spirits. And with Drizzly, you can send the gift of drinks right to your loved one's doors. Drizzly lets you compare prices from local liquor stores on a huge selection of beer, wine, and holiday spirits, then get them delivered right to that lucky someone's door in under 60 minutes. And right now, Drizzly is giving customers $5 off their first order. Just enter promo code JINGLE at checkout. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Keith, obviously you watch plenty of Bundesliga, just like the rest of us. I mean... Dortmund are six points clear. You know, it, it's been a fantastic first half of the season for them. Uh, Pulisic will be leaving, so there might be extra money for them to spend or whatever, or an extra space in the squad. Is, is there any part of that squad that you feel they could strengthen, or anyone that you've seen maybe in the Bundesliga or even abroad that you think would be a great addition for them? 
Yeah, I, I think I think the guys just mentioned Togan Hazard would be a, a good signing for me. Someone that fits their profile, I think, fits their system really well. Um, you know, I've heard the rumors about Timo Werner too, but from my understanding, they have you know absolutely zero chance of getting Werner. I, I think for Werner, he wants to go to a club that doesn't have the reputation of being a sell-on club, and despite the fact that Dortmund have all of this money, they're still going to be regarded uh, as that way by the very elite players in European football. So it's going to be difficult to attract that level. I think Thorgan Hazard just falls underneath that, so I think he'd be a good signing. Uh, I, I do think Akanji and, and Diallo played really well this year. I'm not a big fan of Toprak, so I think that's an area that they could look to to bolster as well. And I, I think you have to right now because you're six points clear. You look at history over the last four or five years. You look at what Bayern Munich are doing with an eye towards next season. You may never get a better opportunity to win the Bundesliga over the next five, six years again. So I, I think if if they do feel like there's someone right now that they can go out and get, they have to open up the poor strings. They have to add that player. And uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons why it was so important to keep Pulisic. Even though he hasn't played well, he does give you depth. But I would be looking to add as well to ensure that you, you take advantage of what was a, a, an incredible first half of the season. Yeah, maybe just yeah. to intersect there, I, I think Keith, I think Dortmund really want to walk away from this whole image of being a developing club. I mean, Watzke has been saying that in, in a few interviews, and I, I, I know that you're probably right that Timo Werner will probably end up with another club in Germany, but um, I think they sooner or later, if they really want to make that step, they have to start targeting players like that. Don't you think so? Oh, I, I think it's definitely you have to try target them. My issue was going to be not convincing, uh, you know, Vatska or anybody at the club, hey, this is the route we want to go. It's, you know, for me, trying to explain to Timo Werner, hey, we know what we've done in the past, but this is a new a new way of doing things. Um, I, I would even add to the fact that Jaden Sancho and players like that probably went to Borussia Dortmund seeing it as a stepping stone club. Now, if they have great success, that may change. And if they do have success in getting the likes of Timo Werner. That would change the, the, the way they're perceived in, uh, in the European market. But as it stands right now, it's going to be very difficult to be, you know, to sign that first player and, and get that over the finish line in terms of signing one of the elite finished product players. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think they're going to get, and, you know, from what I've been told, are not going to get Timo Werner. Well, I mean, Keith, if you're saying that, you know, that Timo Werner wants to go to a, a club that's, not seen as a sell-on club. Um, and Manu, you're saying that you can see him going to another German side. Does does that mean that he's going to end up at Bayern? Is, is that what we're kind of coming to the answer of? I mean, I, I don't mind taking that. You know, for me, I, I think if Bayern want a top-level German player, invariably he ends up at Bayern. And, you know, when, when RB Leipzig came into the league two seasons ago, for me, they were a breath of fresh air. I thought, this is a club that's going to compete. They're going to try to keep their players. Um, so I think it's a massive blow to RB Leipzig if they lose Timo Werner. Obviously, he, you know, he's not going to sign his new deal. They are going to lose him. But I think they have to do everything in their power to ensure that he doesn't go to Bayern. Having said that, we, we've seen how the market works nowadays. It's, it's dictated by what the player wants, what the agent pushes for. Um, and ultimately, the decision is going to rest with Timo Werner. But the signs are there. That you know, if he does stay in Germany, that it's going to be Bayern Munich. Yeah, it's an interesting one, Bryce, because um, I know that Bayern are not a hundred percent sure yet about this transfer. Uh, I mean, they don't want to have a second Leroy Sané where they're missing out on someone because back with Leroy Sané, they they had players playing in that position, but ultimately it would have probably been the right move. Now they feel like, well, where would they put him, right? But on the other hand, good players, you can always find room for good players. So um, I think this is, and I think that's what you kind of are alluring to, right, Keith? This is very much pushed by the player and the agent um, that that moved to Bayern. Um, and this, this interview that he gave and the statements that you hear in Munich very much allure towards that. So um, I think I think that is where a lot of that talk is coming from. Yeah, well, I feel that we need to talk a, a little bit further about Byron. And so, uh, Chris, I, I'm, I'm going to bring you back into the conversation here. and We'll, we'll speak a little bit about uh, who Byron have been linked with continuously and it's uh, in the, constantly in the media over here in the UK, and that's um, Chelsea youngster Callum Hudson-Odoi. Um, 
how close are Bayern to getting this deal done? And it's going to be another potential young star heading uh, over to the Bundesliga. Well, if you go by um, some of the journalists in the UK that are, are very close to Chelsea, it's almost a formality um, that he'll move. Now, whether he does or not, we'll have to wait and see because he was handed um, he was handed a shot at game time last night in the um, EFL Cup, the English League Cup, um, in the semi-final against Tottenham. Would he have been afforded that chance had Bayern Munich not been knocking on the door? Not 100% sure on that, but they, I mean, certainly the reports that I've read recently are that his head has decided that he's going to go with Bayern and maybe it's a too little too late for Chelsea, but I think it would be, calm is probably the, the wrong word, but Chelsea are, have had a habit of sucking up all this fantastic youth talent not doing anything with it, sending it out on loan and then never hearing from it again. So if they were to lose maybe the real biggest gem they've had in five, six, seven seasons to to another club in another league, I, I think maybe that might tell them a little story about how they need to look on youth players in the future. And maybe that's why Sari was brought in. But as Keith's already said, how long will he be there for? You know, are Chelsea really going to be a development club Maybe this is something that um, Hudson Adoy is looking at as well, because if he goes to Bayern Munich and if he goes for 40 million euros, you know you can guarantee. I mean, that's I'm pretty sure that's Bayern's second highest ever transfer fee as it stands at the moment, and I don't think he'll be um, put on the bench for that. He'll be starting regularly when he moves. So he's probably also looked at the likes of Jaden Sancho, who. You know, Manchester City wanted to keep him, but he probably would have been playing in the League Cup or FA Cup. He's gone over to Germany. He was drip fed in a little bit, but now his first full season, he's flying there, you know, absolutely flying under um, Lucy, uh, Lucien Favre. So I think maybe he's got one eye on that and, and maybe that's why he wants to move. But I do get the feeling it might just be a little little bit too late for Chelsea trying to keep him now um, because by all the reports and very well-connected Chelsea journalists, it looks like he's going to be moving just when. And Manu, you, you did a report for the Football Grad website this week um, just on uh, this, this rising star. I mean, what else can you uh, tell us about him? I mean, what kind of player is he? Yeah, he's he's exactly the kind of player that Bayern in many ways I'm, I'm missing whenever Ribery and um, Robben are injured and um, giving the age that's that's been happening more and more often, right? Um we had Archie um, returned on a few weeks ago and he said there's something very special about these up and coming English players, right? This, this very direct approach, the, the ability to take the ball and just run straight at defenders and beat them. And that's something that the German youth development system has been sort of missing out on. And that's why Bayern signed, for example, Alfonso Davies from the Whitecaps, because he's that sort of player as well, someone who runs directly at a defender and, and beats them and, they're very much seeing that kind of potential in um, Callum Hudson Odoi as well. And I, I watched the game um, yesterday in the, the League Cup, um, and you, you could see that kind of potential there. The, the fact that he is that kind of player that can just run at, uh, at a defender and beat them. He's very athletic. He's very fast. Um, his his dribbling values are through the roof. Um, it's yeah, he's a very exciting player. And Chris is quite right. Forty million euros. Um, he would be the third most expensive player to ever um, be signed for Bayern. Maybe the fourth if they get another transfer done. We'll get to talk about that, I guess, in a bit. Um, but yeah, there's a reason why Bayern has looked at this player and why Hassan Saleh Mahamidzic today, the sporting director, said that they're very interested in getting this deal done. And um, I think Bayern fans can be overall very excited if this deal does get done. I mean, Keith, this is obviously a player for the future for Bayern, but that probably has enough potential to come into the side straight away. Um, I mean, it, with Bayern, they're obviously trailing Dortmund, as we've already mentioned. It, is it that this is the type of player that they need? They they need a player with a, you know, a bit of a spark, you know, a, a bit of an attacking flair, or, or do they need a lot of areas um, actually covered, whether that be in January, the summer, or the next few years? I, I think the signings we're seeing Bayern make him right now are with one eye on on that evolution of the the entire squad. Probably something that should have happened 12 months ago. We saw it kind of almost come to a head with Ancelotti. Heinkes steadied the ship, but I think he just kind of papered over the cracks that this was a 
a squad getting old together, a very opinionated squad that kind of made it difficult for younger players coming in to, to have a, a, an incredible impact. So I, I think Pavard, you know, is a, a, an excellent young defender. Lucas Hernandez, if they can get him too, is a, is a top young player. And Hudson Adoy, you know, I've followed him for a couple of years. I have, I have friends who are close, you know, uh, close followers of the Chelsea Academy. They've always talked to me about th- their line as being that he's, he's better than Jaden Sancho. Well, you know, for me, with the way Sancho has played over the last six, eight months, that's, that's quite the, the, the statement to make. But I think any time I've watched him, I was at Stamford Bridge at the weekend, uh, where he set up both goals in, in the cup win against Forrest. So you can see that he has that change of pace. He's electric in the final third. Um, I think Bayern Munich tend to do their business very well indeed. It's a player they've identified. Um, you know, for me, if I'm Dortmund, I would have wanted perhaps Hudson Adoy to be included in any deal for Pulisic. I would have, I don't know whether that question was broached, but I definitely think, uh, he's a player that has the ability to, to go to the very top. Very similar to Sancho and, and, you know, Bayern Munich will be hoping for similar results. Yeah, that's, that's basically key for what you just said. That's exactly the, the kind of feedback that we got on the Football Guard Network. We spoke to someone from f- close to the, Chelsea Academy as well. And they were just raving about this kid. Um, just about the abilities that he had and very confused why, why Chelsea are not playing him. And I think that's when I, when I watched him. And um, when you look at the likes of William, Hazard doesn't really look like he wants to be there anymore. Uh, I, I just don't understand why he doesn't get more playing time there. Um, I can't really see just, just from the eye test, I can't really understand why, why Sari is not using him more. This raises other questions as well, and we'll we'll go to Keith first, but then we'll go back to you, Manu. Uh, Alfonso Davis, uh, I mean, he's arrived just in in November. Um, another exciting young player uh, coming you know across the water from the U.S. Uh, what exactly would this deal, if it goes through, mean for him? I mean, is it going to impact on potential playing time that he would have had? Yeah, look, I think if you sign for uh, you know what you would consider just below the elite clubs in, in European football. And uh, no disrespect to Dortmund fans in any way, but I would, I would include them in that, in that group where if they go out and spend 30, 40 million pounds on you, you're going to play. Um, I know Chris mentioned that Bayern don't always splash the cash. Uh, they're not notoriously big spenders in the transfer market. But I think anytime you sign for a club like Bayern, uh, who are in the very top level of, of, of clubs in European competition, you know that, you know, that's the hard work is just beginning. So for Alfonso Davies, his job is to go in, you know, perform at a high level. You know, I've watched his development over two years. I think this year he improved immensely over last year in terms of decision making and end product. So for him, it's about continuing his own development. If he's looking over his shoulder, if he's worried, uh, you know, uh, you're not necessarily the type of player that's going to do well at, at Bayern Munich. But anytime you sign, I think his agent would have told him. Every year, Bayern are going to be linked with top-class players. You are going to be in competition to play at the very top level for this team year in, year out. What makes Ian Robin and Ribery so special is they've taken on all comers over a decade, and, and you know they're still at the top of the the hill. So I think that's the you know that's the the the, the threat for a Davies or a Hudson Adoy. But um, I, I think you know when you're a young player with that talent, you have to have the the strength of or the mental strength to believe that you're going to, you know, be better than all of these other young players coming in. But it, it, it certainly adds to the attacking depth when you consider come on and Gnabry, I think he's had a good first half of the season as well. So it's uh it's promising signs for the, the strength and depth of that squad going forward for, for Bayern Munich. Yeah. Maybe to, to add to that too. And I a hundred percent agree with you, Keith. I think if you sign for Bayern, you know what you're getting yourself into, right? And um, I was on a Canadian soccer show this this morning um, where they asked me this very same question. What is Hudson Odoi's uh, potential signing going to mean for Alfonso Davies? And um, I said to them, look, Arjen Robben and Frank Ribéry, this is for Robben. We know this is his last season for Ribéry. I think it's going to be his last season too. That means they have um, Gnabry, Coman, Davies and... Um, and potentially, um, Callum Hudson Oidoi under contract for, for, that's four wingers for two positions. Um, that's, that's normal competition if you play at a, pl- a top club, right? You, every position at least has one or two players for it. Um, at least two players for it, especially at a club like Bayern. So, 
I I don't think Davies signed for Bayern expecting that, you know, this is going to be his future. Robin and Ribery are going to retire and he's just going to walk into that first squad. It's just not going to happen. So um I think he knows this. I think also, though, that Bayern very much promised him, look, if you come here, we'll give you a legitimate chance. We're going to work with you because they, especially in tactical aspects, it's a big st- step from MLS. Um, I watched Davies week in and week out covering the Whitecaps full time, right? And I'm covering the Bayern at the same time, uh, almost full time. So it's like, it's, it's, it's watching two completely different worlds. And I think making that step is, um, is going to be a big one, but I think Bayern are prepared to help him make that step. And especially next summer when two of the um, potentially six wingers that will be on the contract are gone, I, I, I think that he will have a very good shot at this. And Chris, uh, we, we talked about, you know, Callum hudson Odoi um, coming over to Bayern. And obviously Sancho's already there as well. And we will be talking a little bit more about the US link with the Bundesliga. But we're starting to see a few more English youngsters um, head over that way as well. Uh, why do you think this is? Do you, do you think Sancho doing so well is kind of influencing German sides to maybe look at you know, the English markets? I think it's just a continuation. If you look at um, Leipzig, obviously signing Oliver Burke a while back from uh, Nottingham Forest, they were continuously linked with Nottingham Forest talent as well. That eventually didn't transpire that they signed. But I think German sides are looking at English sides because, or English academies because they know the kids coming through have got that rawness. You know, look at the likes of Raheem Sterling. Nothing really phases him. He just wants to get his head down and run and get to the far end and either pick out a pass and assist or score himself. So, and as Manu and Keith have already said, and as Archie said a couple of weeks ago, it offers a different dynamic. So, I, I think we also need to remember that it's not a path paved with gold. There's also been players from England, or maybe not English players, but players from English clubs that have gone over and have maybe haven't hit those same heights. I mean, from Liverpool just alone, if you look at Ryan Kent, who went to Freiburg, OK, he did OK, but he didn't really get that much time. Divock Origi went to Wolfsburg and bar a fantastic assist in the last game or the second to last game against Cologne, he, he pretty much really didn't do something. Now, OK for him. He did work under three different managers, so there may be a little bit of an aspect there. But it, I don't think the path's paved with gold, just like I don't think it is the other way with teams from the Premier League buying from all over the world. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it does work out. But I think German teams now are specifically doing their homework and they're identifying players who they want to sign. If you look at Phil Foden from Manchester City, that was a player who was identified now he's a Manchester City born and bred lad who supports Manchester City so I think he was always going to stay there and and he's doing quite well when he's getting his chances now but I think it shows that um, German sides are looking at English youth just like they'll be looking at Spanish youth but when they make the move it's got to be for the right player at the right time. And Keith you mentioned uh, Pavard we've now seen that that deal has been done even though we kind of knew that it was heading that direction for quite some time but again another young star a player that's been playing very well in the Bundesliga and has plenty of experience for for the age he is I mean how good a signing is this for for Bayern? I I think he has the potential to be a a top signing I don't think he's been as good this season as we saw last year Um, but I think when you look at his age uh, already the experience he's, he's had in the game I think he has all the attributes to play as a fullback, as a centre back, as a wide centre back in in a, in a back three. And again, you look at the price in in the modern game when you consider some of the prices that are being talked about for for players, particularly in England. I think Bayern go in, they get their business done at a, at a really good level. And I think he's a player that could be there for you know six, seven, eight years. And and with that, that represents tremendous value for money. Um, you know, you look at Kimmich, you look at Zule, who I think has been absolutely superb this year. He's been the better of, of all of their centre backs. So all of a sudden you have a, a much younger core of a defensive unit to build upon for the, the next half a decade. And I think that's only a, a positive for Kovac or whoever it is that, that coaches the team moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, if we go to you, Manu, I mean, what exactly has happened with Lucas Hernandez? There, there was plenty of talk about him after the Champions League draw. Is is that deal still going to go forward? Um, y- maybe. Um, I think Bayern still would like this this deal to go through. Um, I know that they're very interested. 
Um, the, the big question, of course, is, is it going to happen in January or in the summer? And I think they have, they've met a couple of times of Atletico and they've sort of, um, backed off a little bit. Um, clubs talk to each other, right? Um, not every club is like PSG that just triggers the, the exit clause and just, uh, goes, walks away with the player. So, um, in this case, it looks very much like that Lucas Hernandez will stay there till the summer. Um, that could mean in turn that Bayern will get this player for less, um, than the 80 million that, you know, that is his current exit clause. Um, that's sort of what they're talking about. But I think if Atletico, because Atletico also trying to resign or sign Hernandez to a new deal. And if Bayern feel like, okay, um, this is something that we want to prevent, they, I think they'd be more than willing to just go and pay the 80 million euros because with Pavard, with Hernandez and with Sule, they have a backline um, that will include a 22 year old, two 22 year old world champions and Niklas Sula, 23 year old defender. You know, they'd be, they'd be set for years, even for an astronomic, it sounds like a big amount of money, 80 million euros, but you know, that would be a, something that would set them up for years to come. So I could totally see them just say, okay, look, we'll get this done now, done, um, sort our backline out for years and um, just make sure we have, have it all shored up. And I, I don't think anyone in, in the world would blame them for that. No, not at all. But Chris, if, if they do get these deals over the line, do you see them being the injection that they possibly need to, to you know, narrow the gap and uh, possibly win the title in the end? Well, I think we're going to come on to um, Bundesliga's second half season wish list. So I might leave that for a little bit, but... Yeah, new players come in. They add, you know, it's old cliche. They add a new bounce to to the squad, but also they've got to be able to gel quickly. Um, so it's going to be interesting if they get the players come in and start playing now straight away. You know, will they need a little bit of teething time together, or will that be ratified on the training ground quite quickly? I mean, if you look at the way Kovac has played, and you look when he played, and the way he coached uh, when he was at Frankfurt, he's exceptional. So I think they do have the right man there to drive these young players forward that they're talking about getting in it's just whether he can get it done quickly because if they drop the occasional point which you know is not unheard of for a team that are building together are Dortmund going to be able to capitalize on that by getting three points where Bayern are are only picking up one and then you're looking at three four game times later and that six point gap might have gone to nine or ten and and then it becomes all about preparing for the season after and I think if Bayern get all these players that they're after maybe write the second half of this season off and, and prepare for the next season because I think then we could have a phenomenal season. Absolutely. It's been an exciting one so far and yeah, we'd like it to continue that way, wouldn't we? Um, Keith, I'm, I'm going to go back to you. We're going to talk a little bit about um, US players in the Bundesliga. Obviously, you're based over there. Um, first of all, what, what is it that happens to bring all of these uh, young US stars over to the Bundesliga. Is there anything in particular? I mean, we see it quite regularly, don't we? And we see it continue to even this season. Yeah, it's actually happened in the past too. There's been a, a lot of players, Irvin Para, Mario Rodriguez. I think I think they went to Kaiserslautern back in the day. So th- there's always been that kind of, uh, you know, door open to, to young US players. But I just think the emergence of Christian Pulisic and what he's done over the last few years has kind of opened the eyes to a lot of young players. Um, the other side, on the other side of the coin, for for German clubs, they can essentially come over here, look at the top players, and not have to pay a transfer fee in any way for for top talent. So I, I think it's a win for the clubs, for players who have a desire to play at the very top level. It's a it's a fantastic situation, and I think it's one that will continue to happen. We, we have a, a couple of new signings. And obviously, Josh Sargent has, has got a couple of goals now. Sebastian Soto at Hanover is a player who I rate very highly. Alex Mendes is going to be a great pickup. Uli Yanez at Wolfsburg. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Tyler Adams as well. So, um, you know, the invasion's not about to end anytime soon. There's going to be a lot more young, talented U.S. players. I, I think it's great exposure for them. And it's also great for the Bundesliga, it's selfishly for me, because... Obviously, I cover it here in the United States. Yeah, well, absolutely, Keith. Um, I mean, if, if we start off by talking about one of the players that you just mentioned in Tyler Adams, um, he's at RB Leipzig. Uh, 
a lot of people are kind of uh, suggesting that he might be the replacement for you know that Naby Keita hole still in that side. I mean, what do you believe, Keith? Do, 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 what kind of player are we talking about here? I mean, how good a player have RB Leipzig uh, managed to get from uh, New York Red Bulls? I, I think he's a fabulous young player. Um, he's a high-energy midfielder. So I, I think in that regard, he fits into the style that Leipzig have you know, built over the last couple of seasons. Uh, he kind of reminds me of, I'm not saying he's anywhere near as good as this player, but you know, back you know, 20 years ago, watching a Paul Ince, who was considered a defensive midfielder, but would always try drive forward from that holding role or, or play as what we would call a number eight now. I, I think that's what Tyler tries to do. I, I think it's unfair to compare him to Naby Keita because I think Naby had a little bit more in his locker in terms of creativity in the final third. Um, I, I think a lot of that creativity is uh, from, from Tyler is based upon winning in a high-press situation and then playing playing a simple pass forward. So, um, But I think he has all the attributes to, to really add to that midfield. I think Diego Demi and, and Campbell have done a good job together, but they, they just lack a little bit of something. I, I think Tyler will give them that, you know, runner from midfield. And, you know, what I want to see from him in Germany, in the Bundesliga, is add to the goals, add to the assists, because we didn't see those in very big numbers in, in MLS. But having said that, incredible kid, tremendous talent, and I think he's going to fit in very well at Leipzig. Yeah, exciting times for him and for, I suppose, the the U.S. national team as as well as one of their players gets to play in one of the top leagues in Europe. Um, Manu, if if we go to you, what about Josh Sargent? I mean, we we've seen him score his goal. I remember his his first one was a rather quick one, wasn't it? It was a header, just more or less on the line. Uh, but what what kind of player? Is he for anyone that's maybe unfamiliar and kind of just tuning in now? And um, what type of player are we hoping to see him turn into? Yeah, I like I like Josh Sargent a lot. Um, it's always good to see a ginger in the in the Bundesliga. <laughs> um, he's he just has a. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> I know Keith likes that too. I guess uh, he, he's a he's he has that energy that you see with a lot of these um, American players coming over. I mean Tyler Adams. First press conference, he has that easiness, you know, to just walk right into a room and make everyone feel, uh, you know, good about themselves and feel, feel confident about themselves. And Josh Sarge, you see that too. He's, he's a player who did very well for Werder Bremen's Regionalliga side. And there has been a lot of talk in, in Germany, some linking him to maybe being a bit like Miroslav Klose, you know, that kind of forward, just very, energetic very very good nose for the goal i mean he came in and scored right away and on his debut and then he scored again and in, in his second appearance as well and um to come off the bench and have an impact right away is not an easy thing to do and um especially if you're that young right so for him to to, to make that step so quick and adjust so quick it's a really good sign i this is a player i really like and i think we're going to have a lot of fun with him in the second half of the season and a player that we've seen a, a little bit more of, if, if we're just to go back to uh, Keith again, it, um, at Schalke is uh, Weston McKinney. Um, how impressed um, have you been with him this season? And is there a little bit of talk um, over stateside um, about him and about the performances he's been putting in? Yeah, uh, you know, Weston's a player that, you know, I originally saw at 14, 15. I recommended him to a couple of different clubs. Um, he ended up at Schalke. I, I think... He initially came in and done well. I think this season he's been the victim of being a versatile player. So we've seen him play up front. We've seen him play off the forward. Uh, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, he's going to be a central midfielder. But I think the fact that he's been moved around so much has, has affected his form. Um, but I also, I also would have to say when he has played in midfield for, for limited spells this season, he hasn't been at the level that I would expect from him. So I think if you talk to Weston, he'd be the first one to tell you that uh, the season hasn't gone according to plan for him, um, but but there's a lot of talent there. Again, a lot like Tyler, he likes to drive forward from midfield, very powerful. Um, in a little bit of a lull right now, but I, I expect him to bounce out of that. And and you know, you look at the Schalke team; they've all struggled as well. So I don't think it's just Weston McKenney, but I expect a, a dramatic improvement in him over the second half of the season. And a player that again, if he applies himself has the ability to, to play at the very top level in the Bundesliga for many years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Keith, I mean, you mentioned that you know d- different clubs uh, maybe speak to you for recommendations, or or maybe because you know you you're following the MLS uh, rather closely. If you were to look at say uh, you know over in America at the moment, is, is there any US young talent that that you would especially highlight you know for any clubs that that did come uh, asking for for advice? Well, my favorite was Ledesma, who was uh, signed for I think he signed for. PSV, if I'm not mistaken. So a player that I, I really enjoyed watching play. Um, Julian Araujo is a, a young defender who's with the, the USU 18s. Um, is another player who I think could, could add to a squad. And, and, and then I think the, the ones that have already signed that will be over over the next 12 months, Uli Yanez and Alex Mendes. Mendes in particular is a, a midfielder with a sweet left foot, can, uh, can dictate the pace of a game, can score goals from distance. And has a has a confidence about him, not an arrogance, uh, uh, you know, a confidence about him that you know he he knows he's going to work hard enough to be at the top level, and and he's a player that if he continues that trajectory can can really do damage at Freiburg when he when he gets there. So those are the players that you know over the next twelve to twenty four months that you know I'm kind of really excited about seeing develop in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I suppose with the players going over to Europe as well, it only does the Bundesliga some good as well in in North America. I mean, how popular is the league over there? It's it's very popular. It's it it is popular, and it, it's a lot of that you know popularity stems from the fact that you know it's a chance for young Americans uh, young Americans to go in and do well. You know, when you know I, I had the pleasure of calling Josh Sargent's uh, goal against Leipzig when he came on as a sub and. You know, within five minutes, it was viral all over the place. U.S. Soccer's Twitter was was sending it out. You know, our own Twitter, Fox Soccer. So these are moments that, you know, we've kind of waited for for a long time. Uh, you know, Clint Dempsey did well in the Premier League. A lot, of, a lot of great goalkeepers as well. Brian McBride, another player, went to the Premier League. But I don't think we've ever seen this amount of numbers uh, at any one time go across and have the ability to perform in a top league in European competition. I think that alone makes it a, you know, a, a must-watch for for US fans. You know, when we're we're scheduling games, you know, we do our, our, our production calls. You know, we're always talking about well, Werder Bremen. Okay, is Sargent going to be in? Freiburg, when does Mendes arrive, and so on. So it, it, it's it's an excitement not just for the fans, but I, I have to be honest for for ourselves too, as as commentators and and people that are bringing the game to to everybody's home here in the states to to get the opportunity to. To kind of give them the first glimpse of of the next generation of U.S. soccer. Yeah, absolutely. It's I, I think it's doing a probably doing a good job. You know, the the youngsters heading over there, isn't it? Um, but Chris, we're gonna we're gonna go back to you. Um, you did mention that we were gonna do a a second half of the season wish list. Uh, so we'll start with yourself. Um, what exactly would you like to see? Um, in the second half of the season, I'm, I'm going to say probably Dortmund win the league. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be shy about this, Bryce. Obviously, you, you will know, and and people who listen to the podcast will know that I, I'm over in Dortmund regularly. I've got friends in the city. Um, I think the club's fantastic. It's always been very welcoming. Um, the way you're hosted at the ground, and and that's from all the staff at the marketing team, as well as the social media team, and the and the press liaison. They just it's a fantastic feel and a fantastic vibe to the club. So. Yeah, personally, I would like to see Dortmund run away with the title. But, you know, as a neutral commentating on the league, writing articles, etc., I'd like to see a really close title battle. I'd like maybe to go into the last day and, and not know who's going to win the league because I think ultimately that's what everyone wants. They want to go into that final match day with, you know, there's one of three teams who can win the league and there's also six of three teams or there's three of six teams who can go down. I mean, that is, that's the aim. Um probably doesn't look like I'm going to get uh, one of my wishes, which is a, become an annual pilgrimage to the Autostadt in Wolfsburg. Uh, that doesn't look like it's going to happen this year because Wolfsburg are obviously sitting fifth. Um, so it looks like we're going to be going somewhere new for the relegation playoff. But yeah, for the second half of the season, Bryce, I, I just want a, a really exciting title battle. What what I wouldn't like to see is a Dortmund implosion and, and Bayern win the league by eight or nine points again. I think the league needs a total, um, not refresh, but it needs some new blood winning the title to, to lift everybody. So that's what I'd like to see. Maybe likes to get back into Champions League as well. Yeah, that's it. I, I think most of the neutrals or probably just most people that aren't Bayern fans, to, to be honest, wouldn't mind seeing somebody else uh, win the league. Uh, Keith, what would you like to see in the second half of the season? Is there anything in particular? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, what we just touched upon, the, the many young American players, you know, I, I'd love to see Josh Sargent be given a, a run to to play in the first team, to lead that line and, and kind of see if, if he is that goal scorer we all think he can become. Um, you know, the same would apply for, for Tyler Adams. I'd also like Pulisic to have a, a good second half of the campaign as well. Um, you know, to go along the lines of what Chris said, I'd love to see Dortmund bring home the title, but... You know, I want it to be a title race. I, w- I want to have that excitement over the last couple of weeks of the season that we've been void of in the Bundesliga over the last four or five years. And I want to see other clubs recognising that this is a period of transition for Bayern Munich, trying to put their foot on the neck of Bayern. You know, go for it when you play against them. Uh, don't be afraid. You know, go go for the win. I, I don't like to see teams just, you know, sit back and almost give up and, and, and almost... Look it upon, uh, look upon it as a game that you're not going to get anything. I really want to see teams take it to Bayern Munich in the second half of the season. And, uh, and if all of those things happen, I think we'll be all sitting, you know, sitting here in May saying we've had a good Bundesliga campaign. Yeah, that's it. Um, um, Manu, w- what about you? Uh, what, what would you like to see uh, in, in the second half of the season? Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much what the guys mentioned. Um, maybe on top of that, I, I really liked how, the Bundesliga clubs rebounded from a very dire um, European campaign last year. And then Champions League results were very good, I thought. Same with the Europa League. What Eintracht Frankfurt did in the Europa League was just phenomenal, um, winning six out of six. So I would like to see that confirmed in the second half. The Bundesliga is currently sitting uh, second in the um, UEFA um, five-year standings, right, um, for this season, not overall, just for this season. And rebounding from a very poor last year. And I would like to see that continued. Um, I would like to see, um, maybe Bayern and Dortmund do really well against those two big uh, English Premier League clubs. I think those will be ver- two very exciting games. Uh, I fear for Schalke, of course. I just saw what Man City did today in the League Cup. I think that game ended 9-0 for them. Um, I, I wouldn't be so surprised if Schalke gets a similar scoreline, to be quite frank. But at least to see Bayern and Dortmund take it to those, take it to Liverpool and Tottenham and have two really exciting games. Maybe go through, represent the league in Europe. And then, of course, the two Europa League sides, Leverkusen and Frankfurt. Maybe Frankfurt could even go all the way. And I, I think that would be something that I would really love to see after a really Disappointing year 2018 for Germany in international football. Yeah, but hey, we we don't want Bayern to bring it too much against Liverpool. Mike. This is like, a German on, football let's... podcast, Bryce. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm just saying. Just you know, remind you. <laughs> they, they can have an off day. It's fine. It's fine. You know, do, do, come on, Dortmund against Spurs. I think. I'm, but uh, I, I must say, I would quite enjoy if um, Eintracht Frankfurt could get into the Champions League. It, it is a massive ask. I know they're a little bit off the pace at the moment but we've seen how you know, how fantastic they've been in, in the Europa League and just you know, that stadium you know, light up you know on those European nights I, I think that would be quite exciting but um, I don't know I don't know whether they'll, they'll, they'll be able to do it also I'd like to see Cologne get back into the, the Bundesliga um, the, they're they're sitting in second, you know, things are look, looking pretty good um, Manu by the way as Modesta can he play yet? Oh, that's that's a difficult question. We don't really know what's going on, right? With the um, Modeste put in his notice, um, cancelled his contract. The 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 club Tianjin Kuanjin, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, they of course fought tooth and nail, saying he's not allowed to leave on a free contract. And then of course today the news were that their owner got arrested um, for being involved in a pharmaceutical um, scandal in China and that the club in its current legal status has been dissolved and that the license uh, the license is being managed by the regional government that uh, Tianjin is located in. So uh, I, we don't know how that's going to impact the whole Anthony Modesto situation at Köln, but at the same time, I mean, they have in Tirode, I, I think he scored 22 goals in his, the first half of the season. So um, I think they'll be all right, even if Modesto is not going to be available to start the second half of the season. Yeah, interesting, eh? We'll have to see what happens there. Um, Keith, we talked about what we would like to happen for you know, in the Bundesliga, but is there anything that would potentially happen um, that would be good for the fans, apart from maybe, um, as you mentioned, you had a title race, you know, that there's obviously a lot more going on than maybe just the, the top 
you know, two or three clubs. No, I, I think the guys talked about it. I, I think, you know, from a fan standpoint, I think, you know, fans want to see a title race. If you're outside of those, you know, top, you know, Bayern fan or a Dortmund fan who'd like their team to run away with it, I think everybody else wants to see a title race. But uh, the guys touched upon it as well. I, I think the importance of not just representing in the Bundesliga, but representing in European competition. And, you know, I've been so impressed with Eintracht Frankfurt on their Adi Hütter in Europa League this year. Uh, you know, I don't care what anybody says about Europa League. For me, it's a, a wonderful competition. Gives you the chance to lift a European trophy. So I would love to see them go far. Uh, and, and again, Dortmund and, and Tottenham, I think, is going to be a great game. But like you guys, I'm, I'm a Liverpool fan. Bayern Munich, they can, uh, they can leave the Champions League at the next round for me. Everything else that would be great for the fans. Man, who's thinking we're a bunch of traitors here, I think. But um, I, you know, I, I'm not a Bayern fan. You know I support 1860. So I'm just saying be good for the league. Um, I, I know you guys. If you guys are happy, I'm happy. <laughs> That's the attitude. Uh, Chris, um, I mean, if we look at the bottom of the table, I, I feel we have to mention it. Obviously, we've, we've mentioned the top. We've talked about Europe. We've talked about the title race or whatever. But would it be... Also healthy, I suppose, you know, if, if we've seen maybe the, the top or sorry, the bottom, you know, maybe four, five, six, seven teams um, battling it out right, right down to, to the wire as well. I think that would be great. But everything I've seen of Hanover and Nuremberg lately have been dreadful. And there's a reason why there's a gap from 17th to 16th. But if you look at the, the teams around Stuttgart, Augsburg, um, Fortuna, you know, even Schalke are in that danger area. Um, there's four points that separate 13th to 16th. So we could end up with another fight for, you know, the dreaded hell of the playoff place. Um, but it might be the year that um, Manu gets his wish and his, his Bavarian friends in Augsburg end up in that relegation slot. I can't believe uh, Manu's so quiet about it, eh? But, uh, um, I was supposed to be neutral, right? Well, if you haven't got anything nice to say, you know, then don't say anything at all, I suppose. But, um, Guys, that more or less does it. I think we've rambled on enough um, about the different transfers going on and also US ties and what we'd like to see. Uh, Keith, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, we'd love to have you on again in the future. Um, just, I suppose, that I'm going to put it out there and, and, and say, is there anything that you would like to promote uh, that is going on in your life? Um, because if so, then now's the time to do it. No, I think, you know, just for any U.S.-based fans, continue to, to join us on, on FS1 every Saturday and Sunday morning for the Bundesliga. I think, you know, just this conversation alone has, has got me excited for the second half of the campaign to kick off next week. And uh, I think it's going to be an excellent second half of the season. Yes, most certainly. Uh, Keith, and just on, on social media, likes of uh, Twitter, where, where can people uh, find anything that you're maybe writing or getting involved in? Yeah, just that Keith Costigan, uh, you know, anything that I do will be posted on there via Twitter. You know, you can interact with me. You can complain about what I said. You can, you know, rib me on, on my predictions being wrong. So uh, all in good fun. So I, I was like interacting with people on Twitter, except Chris. <laughs> oh, oh, of of course. <laughs> I, I, we're not even going to go into predictions. Predictions are a minefield aren't they uh, and that brings me to Manu um, Manu what exactly have you got going on across the uh, football grads network um, yeah so basically reactionary at the moment just covering um, the big name signings coming into the league and then um, you know I, I cover the Bundesliga for Forbes of course and then um, slowly gearing up Towards the MLS kicking off in a couple months as well. So that that's for Pro Soccer USA. Oh yeah, I'm I'm actually heading to Germany in a few weeks to do do a bunch of games um, over Munich, uh, Bavaria area. The um, depend depending of course on accreditation as well. The Schachter Donetsk against Eintracht Frankfurt game. I'll be doing that. Um, so all of that can be found on on Football Guard Network. Nicely done. It's never that quiet across the Football Grand Network, is it? And Chris, you have not been quiet at all, but uh, what would you like to possibly promote? Well, obviously, I've still got my Premier League stuff going on um, for various places, but the main outlet for that is this is Anfield and it's very Liverpool heavy. Um, but I'm really looking forward, like Keith and Manowata, the return of the Bundesliga this week. Uh, well, sorry, on the 18th, that, that game on the Friday night is is a fantastic one to kickstart and hopefully it will kickstart all the Saturday games into life and then 
you know, I'm really looking forward to watching Leipzig take on Dortmund because if um, if results go the way of Bayern, we could have an instant title challenge back on on the first day. Well, that's it. There's there's some very interesting games that we're edging closer and closer. RB Leipzig versus Borussia Dortmund, Hoffenheim versus Bayern Munich. The, the list kind of goes on, doesn't it? There, there's quite a few interesting ones there. We are getting closer. Hopefully this podcast has helped fill that void um, a little bit for you. And thank you very much for tuning in. As always, I've been your host, Bryce Dunn. You can find me on Twitter at BryceDunn11. And until match day begins, I'll feed us in. Ich wart seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb's sein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen, ich hab zu holen. It wouldn't be the holiday season if there wasn't candy, right? Celebrate the holiday season with the Holiday Crush. They've sprinkled candy with a holiday theme and fun-packed challenges every week for five whole weeks, finishing on January 4th. The more challenges you complete, the better your chances of unwrapping delicious rewards. So, are you ready to crush the holidays? Play the Holiday Crush now. Download it from the App Store, Google Play, or Windows Store for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.